sense of God, it comes to an understanding that we are not living here alone, that we're not responsible for everything, that God knows that we're weak and frail and we've got all these difficulties. And so God has sent not only his Holy Spirit, not only is God working in our lives with, with a new nature, not only does he allow just a certain element of temptation to come in his lives, God says, you know what? In a general way, I'm going to be the God who is the provider. That's where providence comes in. It is where God is providing for us in our lives, both physically and spiritually. The actual definition of what is the providence of God, it is the working out of what God is working in our lives. It is the working out of what God is working into our lives. Psalm 57, verse 2 and 3 says this, I cry out to God most high, to God who fulfills his purpose for me. He sends from heaven and saves me, rebuking those who hotly pursue me. God sends his love and his faithfulness. When God directly intervenes in your life and you experience his love and his faithfulness and his aid, that is coming from the, in a, in a sense, if he has a room, that's coming from the room of the providence, the providence of God. We talk about the sovereignty of God, God's justice and mercy, but when God intervenes, it's coming from his providence. The concerns of when we talk about the providence of God, it is his interventions. It is his tender care. It is his preventing interventions. I'm so thankful for that phrase, for his, his, preventive, his preventing interventions. That he, he says, Ron, I, I need to help you right now. Don't step another step. Don't go any further. Don't keep thinking those thoughts. What are you thinking about, Larson? They, don't you realize this is wrong? When God does that, that is his intervening prevention. That's his providence of God. Now let me give you four specific ways that God helps us in reference to his providence. And I suspect that many of you are going to identify. I bet if I asked you to raise your hand if these things happen to you, I would suspect there'd be a number of hands that would be up. Here's the first one. See, there are times that God delivers us from the evil one by sending individuals with biblical counsel and advice. Let's just do it right now. Has there been anyone here that in the midst of a need in your life, God sent someone to you and they just spoke the word of God to you? Is there anyone here? Okay. I know I have. Here's the second one. There are times when, when God hinders the means of evil. Second Chronicles, the 20th chapter, verse 35 through 37, is an example of that, and also Psalm 35, 1 through 10. What I'm meaning by this is that when that's where God hinders or puts a limit on evil or Satan himself. Or that's where God restrains evil from going beyond uh, that's where God puts boundaries up. The third way that God in his providence delivers us from the evil one, there are times when, when God delivers us by afflicting our body. That we are, we are put in, in, a, in a bed to, to, to rest. Or that some, we're put in a place where someone has to come and help us. The most notorious, of course, example would be in reference to Paul. He had what he called the thorn in the flesh. Three times he said, God, would you deliver me from, from this, from this affliction, from this problem, from this cause and stress and all? Fa Paul, uh, Father, you know all the things that I'm doing for you. If you would take this away from me, away from my body, I'll have greater freedom. I can move. I'll have less pain, whatever it might have been. And Paul called on the Lord and, and the Lord said, no, I'm not taken away. And the reason he didn't take it away is because he didn't want Paul to have a big head. He didn't want Paul sitting down with a world map and saying, you know what? One of the few countries I haven't been to is Spain. I think I'll go to Spain. I, you know, I've, I've really been around the world and I'm a theologian. I've done this and I've... No, 
God says, listen, in your life you need to be dependent upon me. And when you're just getting a little big in the britches, Paul, I want to make sure that you understand you're going to have this pain for a reason in your life. The fourth way that God delivers us from the evil one is there are times that God delivers us by having his word invade our heart. And it comes at a very decisive moment. I have not often had this happen, but I, I was uh, in a home with a friend. We were on the road doing some evangelism. At two o'clock in the morning, I got up, I turned on the lights. My friend turned to me and says, are you sick? What's, what's wrong? And I said, no, no, just, just leave me alone. And I'm pacing back and forth. I said, where's paper? Where's pen? Where's something for me to write? And he says, why? why? He said, why? He says, it's two o'clock in the morning. Why are you having to do this now? And if you have to do it, I'd prefer that you do it in the hallway and leave me alone. That was Glenn Havamacki. And God had just woke me up. And I had a concern about something for over a month. And I just was able to sit down and to outline on two pages what definitely needed to be done. And I just went back to bed. And my poor friend stayed up just wondering what that all was about. That was an intervention from God in reference to where I needed help. Let me now, thirdly, give you a testimony in reference to personal deliverance. In my life, I believe that this is the, the one major time that I can think of where Satan wanted to bring such evil that my life could have been taken. Let me tell you the story. I'm standing in line at the Boston Naval Army Recruitment Center. And while I'm standing and I've gone through all kinds of tests, I've answered and filled all kinds of forms and so forth. I'm ready to go in the Army. I've graduated from college. I received my induction notice that I was going to be drafted. So I decided that I was going to go in the service for three years rather than two years and to do something they didn't want me to do. I wanted to be able to get my own MOS, it's called, my own division within, my own job within the Army. And when you get recruited, that's... Those are the things you can do. I'm standing in line. I'm ready to go in the army. As soon as I get through this line, I've got to raise my hand, and I've got to swear allegiance to America. I'm going to be a private first class uh, in the United States Army. When a man goes by with a clipboard and a piece of paper, and he yells out to all of us that are standing in line, everyone who, wants, who is in the delayed entry program, step to the right. Delayed entry program. Now, you need to understand, I did not want to be in the Army. I did not want to be in that line at all. And I did not want to, especially at that time, which was the beginning of April or May, to be in that line. But when you get that notice, you simply go. When this man said, delayed entry program, I thought, those are sweet words. That's wonderful. Delayed entry program. And so I stepped out, and I noticed that there was one or two behind me, and there were five of us all together. And the sergeant said, come and follow me, and we're going to go to another desk. Everybody else is going to go and raise their hand, and they're in the army. Well, I waited. I waited for the others to come around, because I have no idea what a delayed entry program is. I just like those words. And so... I got at the end of these four individuals, and so they're in front of me because I'm going to listen to see what is a delayed entry program. Well, they did their paperwork, and finally I came up to a lieutenant, and he said, where's your delayed entry program folder? And I said, I, I, I don't have it. And he said, well, you can't go into that program if you don't have the paperwork. I said, well, I'm willing to do the paperwork now. And he said, no, you, you have to have all the paperwork. You, you cannot do it. And I said, well, I'm, I'm not moving and I'm not budging. And he looked at me and as he stood up. And he said, what's wrong with you? And I, I, I said, sir, I, I said, listen, I'm not in the Army yet, and I don't really want to start this way, but I want the delayed entry program. And he said, well, you just can't do it. He says, get in line. 